Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that is so scary that when he walks through the woods, Bigfoot takes pictures of him. He is the captain. He's so scary. He's so hairy, but he's so cuddly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. Today we reach for a classic. We are drinking Genesee Beer, garage grade, three out of five bottle caps. Genesee Beer is an American icon. Today, every can, bottle, and pint glass delivers the same full taste and quality that made it famous in 1878. Brewed with six-row barley malt, corn grits, and hops, Genesee is truly a great classic beer. And this week's fridge is full. Thank you to these truly great garage guys and girls. First up, we have Erica and Walter in Tracy, California. And big shout out to Laura from Chelsea, Michigan. We like your gym. And next up, sometimes these things are hard to read, but I think this one says Oslin, and she is from Bowling Green, Ohio. And another beer donation from Pam in Omaha, Nebraska. Next, we give a Super Bowl victory cheers to Evan and Philly. And last but certainly not least, we have Casey, April, and Amanda in Johnson City, Tennessee. So thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's shows, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And everybody that donated, we like your jib. And speaking of jibs, Captain, the nice jib tank tops are Mm -hmm. now available, backed by popular demand on our store page at truecrimegarage.com. And they are going fast, my friends, so get them while you can. All right, let's gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. People on the outside do not know what evil is. A quote by serial killer Arthur J. Shawcross. FBI criminalologist and former Army criminal investigator Colonel Robert K. Ressler coined the term serial killer. This term was used to separate them from spree killers and mass murderers. As defined by the FBI, a serial killer murders two or more victims at separate times. Murder is one of the most complicated and difficult crimes to solve. Often there are only two witnesses present when a murder is committed, and usually neither witness is talking, because one is the offender and the other is dead. According to a study conducted in the 1990s, 62% of the time the victim of a serial murderer is a complete stranger. And as we know, stranger-on-stranger murders are extremely difficult to solve. At one time, Arthur J. Shawcross was reported to be the most studied serial killer of his day. Interviewed extensively by local law enforcement, the FBI, and dozens of psychologists, yet no one could say for certain why Shawcross had committed the atrocities we know him to be guilty of. Some wonder if Shawcross himself knew the reasons why. There is little doubt that he was truly evil. This week we take an in-depth look into the life of one man and those around him and examine how one little baby boy grows up to become known as the Monster of the Rivers, the Rochester Strangler, and perhaps the most notorious of all, the Genesee River Killer. Arthur John Shawcross was born in Kittery, Maine 
On Wednesday, June 6, 1945, this coincidentally on the one-year anniversary of D-Day, his parents are Arthur Roy Shawcross and Elizabeth, better known as Bessie or Betty Shawcross. His father was 21 at the time, and Betty was just 18 at the time of Arthur Shawcross's birth. He would be the oldest of four children. The story about his parents' courtship and marriage is a simple one, and it goes like this. His father was in the Marines and had returned to the U.S. in early 1944. He and Betty were childhood sweethearts, both now adults, and later that same year they got married. The name Shawcross is derived from the Old English, which loosely translates as belief in the cross. And the colonel in Old English is translated into drunken bloke. Arthur was born two months premature, but outside of that, there were no complications. He was a healthy little boy. He spoke his first words earlier than average, but walked later than normal. Mm. At four years old, Arthur says this is when he started getting punished by his father using either a broom handle or a belt when he would get into trouble. I want to bring something up right here before we really get into Shawcross's history, something I want all of you to put in your detective handbag and to keep in mind as we discuss this guy. Throughout this timeline, there will be accusations from Arthur about sexual encounters and abusive behavior by multiple family members. Mm -hmm. These have all been adamantly denied by all people involved, except for uh, some of the beatings from his father, which have some school records to support those incidents. I will include some of these stories throughout, but not all, as these are pretty much all unconfirmed accusations by Shawcross. His parents and siblings maintain that he had a normal childhood and state the described events were largely the product of Arthur Shawcross's imagination. But other than these school records, is his family members denying that he was beaten as a kid? Correct. They are denying all of these allegations from Arthur Shawcross as he recounts his childhood. Now, most of the time I would just report all of the stories to you and let, let you all and the captain decide what is the truth and what is not the truth. However, Mm -hmm. in this case, I will just repeat a few because there are a lot of these stories and, and I want to kind of back up my reasoning behind that with this Arthur Shawcross would change his stories at times at will regarding these accusations throughout his life. And frankly, I don't believe a lot of them to be true. Mm -hmm. Uh, This first story is true. However, at five years old, Arthur created two imaginary friends. One was called Paul, who was a boy of Arthur's age. And the other was a friend um, who was slightly younger, a blonde haired girl with no name. During the months that follow, Arthur would often carry on long conversations in baby talk with these imaginary friends, which gave others the impression that he was talking to himself. Later, he would tell psychologists and authors, quote, I had to have these friends because I wanted someone to play with. No one else liked me. Now, his childhood consisted of frequent nightmares, bedwetting, which he blamed on his little brother, Jimmy. Um, and he started to stand out as being, quote, odd to others. And he was actually nicknamed by the other school tr- children as Oddie. Mm. At six That's years old. That's not a fun nickname as a kid. No, and I imagine he was probably Artie at mm. one time, you right, know, for right. Arthur. And then they, they Audie, changed that to yeah. Oddie. At six years old, he started running away from home. This is believed that he did this just to get attention as he would often return. He would also kind of tell people in advance, I'm running away. It didn't seem to have any serious significance to his life at that time. Yeah, he would say, Mom and Dad, I'm running away. And they'd say, okay, see you at dinner. (laughs) (laughs) At eight years old, Shawcross began bullying younger children. Hmm. When he was nine years old, he receives the first head trauma incident of which there will be quite a few. He was hit in the head with a stone for which he received stitches and claimed it caused numbness. Now, also when he was at nine years old, and I believe this could be one of the largest impactful moments in all of Shawcross's life. 
not just as a boy, but forever. Okay. So his grandmother on his mother's side, she receives a letter from a lady named Thelma June who lives in Australia. Good day, mate. Who is Thelma June? Well, for those of you who like soap operas, here is your true crime garage soap opera moment of the week. Shawcross's father, remember we had said he served this great country as a Marine. Well, back in 1943, a year before little Arthur Shawcross was born, mm-hmm. his father was actually married to this Thelma June, a woman who had, he had met in Australia while on leave. They had a son together, um, and this was, uh, they named the son Hartley. And after this, after his time was up, he in 1944 returned to the U S he never mentions to anyone that he is technically already married and has a family, uh, when he gets back in and, you know, gets married here in the States and starts a new family. Yeah. Very honest guy. So it's at this very pivotal point that little Arthur Shawcross's mother discovers that his father has a wife and child in Australia. This changes the family dynamic incredibly. And of course, for the worse, At 10 years old, Arthur, he continued his odd behavior, which caused other children to bully him while he bullied weaker, younger children. He began shoplifting and committing other petty thefts. He continued to run away. Again, this is behavior that's strongly believed that Arthur was running away simply for the attention he would receive from his family and others. At this time, he also began to get bad grades. In fact, he flunked the fourth grade and was forced to repeat the fourth grade. Mm. At 11 years old, he says his mother caught him masturbating and threatened him with a butcher knife. And he also would later say that not only did she threaten him, but she inserted a broom handle into his rectum. Moving on. When Shawcross was 13 years old, the Shawcross family moved And a bunch of the extended family moves to Brownsville, New York. So three sets of relatives move nearby. And then this area ends up being nicknamed Shawcross Corner. Hmm. Now, Arthur does not fit in at school at this point. In fact, he doesn't even fit in with his cousins and other family members, according to them. At 14 years old, later in life, this is the age when the sexual claims really start to escalate. As an adult, he would claim that At 14, he was having oral sex with his sister and cousin on a regular basis. He also says when he was 14, he was tricked into getting into a car, which later led him to have been raped by a male stranger. Mm -hmm. Shawcross also said that he was having sex with animals, even killing a chicken during the act. We won't get into that, but chickens were not the only species he claims to have had sex with. All of this extracurricular activity leads to failing the eighth grade. And that's how Arthur Shawcross ends up being 16 years old and still in the eighth grade as he has failed two grades at this point. Are you implying that all the sex with animals is what caused him to do bad in his He studies? should have focused on school. Yeah. Stop having sex with chickens. Right. Leave the chickens alone, Artie. <laughs> Uh, People around him refer to him as a loner with deep mood swings. This is also where we see another case of him occurring a uh, head trauma. He was hit with a discus. Can you imagine that? That's got to be super painful. He was was hit with a discus and spent four days in the hospital. At 17 years old, Art is a freshman at General Brown High School, but he dropped out that same year. So, He would have been 20 years old when he would have finished school, or actually he would have been on pace to fail a grade once more. So 21 possibly at the time of graduation, had he graduated. He'd be drink. He'd be bringing beer to school. Well, that's. Hey, hey, Artie, where you been? Oh, I've just been having sex with some chickens. Bringing new meaning, Captain, to the old Matthew McConaughey quote from Dazed and Confused. I keep getting older and they stay the same age. Those chickens never get older. After dropping out of high school, he used all of that extra free time to burglarize homes and he started peeping in windows. He broke into stores, stealing both merchandise and cash. He, however, is either somewhat skilled at this or at least very lucky because he is never caught, 
nor arrested for these crimes. Right. He also took on a new persona. People say that Shawcross became extremely violent at this age when he would be crossed. He was known to have fired his 22 rifle several times at different people, threatening them. He was feared in his neighborhood. Well, and even though he was bullied, he was bullying the weaker. So I think this was his way of going, if people aren't going to like me, well, then screw them. I'm going to make them fear me. Yeah, and it doesn't take a very tough man to threaten people with a firearm. Right. Now, in 1963, Shawcross was arrested for the first time. This was for burglarizing a Sears department store. He broke into the basement of the store and set off the alarm. Now, he claimed... He had a, he he claimed to have a good reason for this. He told the judge that he was poor and that he was stealing Christmas gifts. So this found favor with the judge. So he was only sentenced to 18 months probation. He received no prison or jail time for yeah. this uh, burglarizing the department store. In 1964, Shawcross found love when he met Sarah Lewis Chatterton. When he was working at the Family Bargain Center store, the two got married in September of 64 at a Baptist church. He would have been, let's see, uh, 19 at the time, and Sarah was 20 years of age. After marriage, he held a job as a butcher, and he claimed it was his favorite job. Here's a quote from Shawcross regarding his time spent as a butcher. He says, quote, I used to eat a lot of raw meat in 64 and 65 when I worked as a butcher. I used to butcher 19 cows a day and just like the taste of raw meat. You know, I just cut off a chunk and I could tell just by the taste of the blood whether we could turn it into steaks or hamburger. Hmm. But Shawcross would not be able to stay out of trouble. And after a probation violation for unlawful entry, his wife, Sarah, files for divorce. The marriage lasted less than two years. Don't judge. Sarah would later go on record as saying Arthur was very immature and always faking illness or injury to miss out on work. Sex with him was lousy. He just couldn't keep it up. At That's because you're not a chicken. At 20 years old, Shawcross is arrested for beating a 13-year-old boy. This is after the youth threw a snowball at his car, what Shawcross called a supped-up Pontiac. For this, Shawcross, that's what he says, supped-up Pontiac. Souped-up Pontiac, I guess is what he's trying to say. For this, Shawcross receives six months probation. He (laughs) is... Okay, so, so he's in his car, and then this teenager throws a snowball... Hits the car. Yeah, I don't know if he he could have been driving or could have just been parked, and uh-huh. he witnessed the boy throwing a snowball at his car. But he the I don't know how aggressive he was with the thirteen year old. But according to the record, it states that he was arrested for beating a thirteen year old boy. Yeah. Now during this time, he he received six months probation. He's also evaluated by a psychologist who labels him as a an emotional an emotionally unstable personality. <laughs> you think? Right. <laughs> you think <laughs> guys have sex with chickens and beating up 13-year-olds because they threw snowballs at him. When he is 21 on April 7th, 1967, Arthur Shawcross is drafted into the US Army. He is private number five two nine six seven zero four one and started his training at fort lee virginia he then completed his basic training at fort benning in georgia and was designated a supply and parts specialist he meets linda ruth neary while on a 30-day leave also while in the military he fell off of a ladder hitting his head and concussing himself Mm -hmm. so another head trauma He marries Linda Neary in October of 1967. They both have stated that they thought that there was a good chance that he would die in Vietnam. So they got married in advance. After getting hitched, Shawcross was stationed in South Vietnam, where he served a 12 month tour of duty with the supply and transport company of the fourth infantry division. 
Mm-hmm. Arthur Shawcross says that he was based in the Central Highlands and was a Rambo type one man first strike weapon fighting in the heat of the action. In one of his letters, he wrote, I shot a woman who was hiding some ammo in a tree. She didn't die right off. I tied her up, gagged her, then searched the area. Found the hut with another girl inside of the age of about 16. Knocked her out with the butt of the gun and carried her to where the other girl was. There was a lot of rice, ammo, and other stuff in the hut. I tied the young girl to a tree. Still gagged. Tied her legs, too. They didn't say anything to me at all. I had a machete that was very sharp. I cut the girl's throat, then took off her head and placed it on a pole in front of that hut. That girl at the tree peed, then fainted. I stripped her then. First, I gave her oral sex. She couldn't understand what I was doing, but her body did. I untied her, then retied her to another small tree. She fainted several times. I cut her slightly from the neck to crotch. She screamed and shit herself. I took my M16, pulled on a nipple, then put the gun to her forehead and pulled the trigger. Cut off her head and placed it on a pole where they got water. Another time, I went on patrol and shot a kid chained up into a tree. He killed one GI with an M1, our own weapon. That made three. Again on patrol, I killed two women in a river after they killed two GIs. They had a map of base camp plus AK-47 rifles and ammo, food, and $280,000 in money belts. I split the money with some guys, smashed the AKs and ammo, took everything else back to camp. We let the bodies drift downstream. He also claimed a combat kill total of 39, which is when investigated later, was also discounted as a fabrication. Authorities claim he killed no one on his tour of duty and saw no action. Shawcross in interviews will talk about his time in Vietnam, and it seems like the story changed from the way I heard him tell it to the way you're telling it, and it's like then if he tells it again, it changes a little bit. I mean, the stories are roughly the same. It's just the details kind of switch. Yeah, and I think there's several things that make that difficult. One, the most likely thing is that he's lying and totally making up these stories and he can't keep his lies straight. Two, he tells different accounts to different people. This this account is taken from a letter that he wrote. Right. Now, he also claims a combat kill total of 39. So often when he's talking about these different let's call murders that he did while on tour. Um, He, he just simply refers to these victims as the girl or the older woman or the boy that was tied up to the tree. Um, He doesn't give any names or a lot of times, not even specific locations to kind of give you an idea of who he's referring to in that long quote unquote combat kill total of 39 that he claims to have had. Well, and he was no John Rambo, right? But that doesn't mean that he wasn't going off on his own and killing people that he wasn't supposed to be killing and just murdering in Vietnam. Yes. I mean, we can't account for every waking minute that he had while on tour on that tour of duty for 12 months. In October of 1968, John... I said John Rambo. John Rambo. Well, on that note... It looks like I need a quick beer break. Cheers, mates. Back to the case of John Rambo. On October of 1968, Arthur Shawcross was reassigned to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, as a specialist fourth class repairing weapons. 
He was honorably discharged in the spring of 1969 and moved with his wife to Clayton, New York, which is located along the St. Lawrence River. He put in a disability claim for war injuries, although Veterans Administration Examiner found no substance to Arthur's claim. The former soldier's constant badgering, though, won him a $73 a month disability pension. Shortly after being discharged from the Army, Shawcross had nightmares and flashbacks. This led him to heavy drinking. He started beating his wife around this time. On one occasion, the beating caused her to miscarry as she was four months pregnant. They should have locked him up for murder, that son of a bitch. Linda then files for a divorce. This is in the fall of 1969, but it does not get finalized until 1971. So seven months after leaving the Army, Shawcross found employment with the Knowlton Brothers Paper Mill. This is the city's largest employer. In April of 1969, he set fire to the place, causing $28,000 worth of damage. Three months later, a hay barn mysteriously caught fire, and it was Arthur Shawcross who had reported the fire. Three days later, he set fire to Crowley's Cheese Company. This was the city's second largest employer, and Arthur J. Shawcross also called the fire department to report this fire. Shortly after the Cheese Company fire, Shawcross attempted to rob a gas station. The proprietor of the business, he knew Shawcross by sight and called the sheriff and Arthur was arrested. During questioning, he ends up confessing to all of his crimes, which included the arson attacks. A Jefferson County judge sentenced Shawcross to five years in Attica prison. While in prison, he claims to have been raped by three other inmates. He also claims he later extracted revenge by beating and raping each of his attackers in separate incidents. He wrote his own version of the incident years later. Titled the misbegotten son quoting Shawcross quote, got raped in Attica prison by three black guys. I was lost, threatened and in pain. I got all three my way, their way. I hurt them like they hurt me. But I used a sock with soap as a blackjack, knocked them out and screwed them, and then smashed them once in the nuts. I was never bothered after that. Shawcross was later transferred to Auburn Prison. Right, so these three black men wanted to rape him. Well, he claims the three of them attacked him Um, the three of them teamed up on him, attacked him and raped him. And then later he decides to get revenge on them, attacking them individually one at a time and raping them. Correct. I think we should keep in mind though here, captain, that with this incident, a lot like the incidents that he talks about from his childhood, there's no one to corroborate any of these stories. You know, this is just Arthur Shawcross saying, this is, I was a victim and then I individually, I was stronger than these people and I attacked them. I was more brutal than they were to me and I was never attacked after that. Well, you, you won the boner award, John Rambo. He was later transferred to Auburn prison. Now listen to this story. This is a, an interesting one. On November 4th, 1970, troopers were sent to Auburn prison when rebelling inmates refused to return to their cells failed to report to assigned workshops and prevented other inmates from doing so as well. By 1145 AM, seven guards had been clubbed by inmates. Inmates armed with boards and pipes seized 30 guards as hostages. Mm -hmm. Prisoners had taken control of the entire prison with the exception of the administration building. 322 troopers were mobilized with an additional force of 300 guards and sheriff's deputies placed in a support role. Corrections officials refused to discuss grievances until all of the hostages were released. The show of overwhelming force quickly ended the rioters' desire to continue the attack. At 3.30 p.m., the first hostage was freed, and inmates started returning to their cells without further incident. Approximately 450 inmates were actually involved in this rebellion. 
This incident would lead to the October 18th, 1971 parole of one Arthur J. Shawcross. That's right. After only 22 months of a 60 month sentence, Shawcross was given an early release when he served, when he saved the life of a prison guard who had been clubbed during the prison riot. How did he save his life? I couldn't find the, the specifics, the detailed report of, of what he did during that to save this officer's life. But that's why he was grant granted leniency on his sentence before his parole hearing. He was examined by the prison's supervising psychiatrist in his report. Dr. William Tucker wrote, Inmate is an immature adolescent with schizoid personality who decompensated an ego functioning under the influence of stress and rejection by his wife. He should be viewed as a schizoid arsonist who requires supervision, emotional support, and immediate referral to a mental health clinic upon parole. Latent projected homicidal intent of at least two of his arsons should not be underestimated. He is a fair parole risk and will require psychiatric treatment plus close supervision. Upon his release, Arthur went to go live with his parents and he got a job. The parole officials insisted that he undergo outpatient psychotherapy at a VA hospital. This was scheduled, but Shawcross regularly missed appointments and no action was taken by the overworked parole officers. After release from prison at 26 years old, he returned to Watertown. He started seeing Penny Shabino. They knew each other from high school. Just after Christmas, the Watertown Public Works Department hired him under the Federal Emergency Employment Program. A supervisor assigned him to a far corner of the 60-acre landfill at the end of Water Street. Arthur Shawcross and Penny got married April 22nd, 1972. So this is his third wife. This would be his third wife. That's correct. Yeah. Penny already had two children when they got married. Plus she was pregnant with Arthur's baby at the time. However, this baby was miscarried. They moved into an apartment at 233 Cloverdale street. Arthur claims that the marriage came under threat when Penny's father accused him of sexually assaulting Penny's younger sister. We need to introduce the Blake family at this time. The Blakes were a rough family, but they loved their children. They had nine children in total, and they lived just about a mile from the far corner of the 60-acre landfill where Arthur Shawcross worked. Jack Owen Blake was the seventh of nine children. And he had once saved his sister from drowning in the Black River. He was 11 years old and in the fifth grade. He was an impressionable boy and he liked to go fishing. He and his brother Peter, who was only nine years old, they would sometimes go to go fishing with a guy that their mother, Mary Blake, had said was sort of a weird guy. Oddie. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And she would, she had warned her son not to associate with the man named Arthur Shawcross. And she didn't like Arthur because she states that this guy was always boasting about his service in Vietnam. And he was also showing the boy photographs of naked women. He rode around on a white woman's bicycle, but the boys ignored (laughs) their mother's warning. They, they like to go fishing and they, and they like playing around the water. So sometimes they would lie to their mother right. and tell her that they were going elsewhere, but then they would often go down by the water. Now Shawcross many times went fishing by himself. When he caught something, he would bring it home, fillet it and cook it up, cook the fish for dinner. Sometimes when Shawcross was down by the water with a line in the water, He would see some children down there playing. Many times he saw the Blake boys come down there. They even started talking to Shawcross at some point, asking him about fishing. So after a while, Shawcross was, he was out walking, heading down toward one of his favorite fishing spots. And he sees the kids and asks them if they wanted to go fishing. This became a regular thing. Shawcross was very much, he very much preferred to be alone So fishing is a great hobby for somebody like him, but he didn't mind the company when he would be fishing. 
And it seemed like he preferred the company of young children compared to that of adults. On Sunday, May 7th, 1972, on that day, the two Blake brothers, Jack and Peter, they went fishing with Shawcross at the Black River. Afterward, Jack headed to a friend's house at the old Cloverdale Apartments just a few blocks away. Peter went home, and that was the last time that Peter saw his brother Jack. When Jack didn't return home later that night, Mary reported to the police that her son was missing, explaining that Jack had wanted to go fishing with Shawcross, and despite her warning, he had probably gone against her wishes. Suspicion, therefore, fell upon Shawcross from the outset. Mm -hmm. Police talked with Shawcross, going to his Cloverdale apartment, knocking on the door. He spoke with them. He told them, yes, he had seen the Blake boys down by the river several times. He had even spoke to the boys on a few occasions, but he denied being with Jack that day. The Blakes, as we said, were a rough family. This was well known in their community, and they were known to be strong disciplinarians. Police began to think that Jack was a runaway. They were able to convince some of Jack's family that the boy had run away as well. But at the urging of a desperate and depressed mother who hounded the police time and time again to talk with Shawcross because, quote, he's weird and he knows something, the police did follow through with her request, but with no other evidence to, to suggest otherwise, Shawcross was released following two interviews with police, and once again, the thought was that Jack had run away from home. Yeah, so we have the family in this situation that they believe that their son is not just missing, mm -hmm. but he was murdered, and he was murdered by Shawcross because he's a weird dude. Right. And this weird guy, Audie, their kid was known to fish with him. And this was, you know, pretty common knowledge to the brother. Mm -hmm. And to the parents. Now, on Friday, May 26th, Arthur Shawcross was again questioned by police. This time, it was when he was caught stuffing grass cuttings down the shirt and shorts of a six-year-old boy and spanking him. Uh, this For this offense, he received a $10 fine and was reprimanded by the court. Wednesday, September 2nd, 1972, Karen Ann Hill, age 8, was last seen playing by the river. She was not from Watertown and was there that day only because her mother was staying with a friend. Now, let's go through the police investigation. Yeah, it's going to start off with the eyewitness reports from children claiming that they saw a man that looked like Arthur, walking Karen across a bridge. Yes, this is the Pearl Street Bridge over the Black River, which would just be a short downhill walk from where Karen had been staying. Although the children didn't know the man by name, they, and specifically a teenage girl, recognized his distinctive white bicycle with its brown mud guards and basket, which he had leaned against a wall. Styling and profiling. From a distance, the curious children watched as the man lifted Karen over the railings and gingerly led her down the bank to show her the fish. When the alarm was raised that Karen was missing, the children came forward to tell the cops what they had seen. At 10 p.m., search officers equipped with flashlights discovered a crumpled body. It was covered by a slab of concrete and lying face down, crammed into a sewage outfall pipe on the south bank of the bridge. Police dogs were called for. They tracked a scent up Pearl Street to Starbuck Avenue and eagerly tugged their handlers left into Clover Street, straight to the stoop of Arthur Shawcross's front door. Karen Ann Hill was found dead under a bridge near the Black River. She had been raped mutilated and strangled when a police investigation revealed that Hill and Shawcross had been seen together earlier that same day. And they received another report that Shawcross was seen eating an ice cream at the bridge near where the body was found. After the dog sniffed out this piece of shit, they're going to take him in for questioning. Well, you have a combination of things happening here. Mm -hmm. So the girl, the poor little girl is reported missing and hours later they find her body. You have the dogs, which you just mentioned. They they walk the officers from the crime scene to the where the body was found to Arthur Shawcross's front door. Right. 
And as if that wasn't enough, they start getting reports from these children that are coming forward and saying, look, we saw a guy that kind of looked like him with somebody that kind of looked like Karen earlier today. Plus, one thing that I think is very telling here is Arthur has a very distinct bike. It it doesn't look like the other bikes in town. You know, this isn't a a bike that is made for an adult. It's white. It has a basket on it. Well, it's made for a woman, and it's a man riding it. So that also Uh, sticks out. Well, I don't know if this is the same bike that he had a long time ago. It probably is. At the autopsy, the medical examiner discovered that the girl had died because of suffocation and her killer had stuffed weeds and debris into the child's nose, mouth, vagina, and rectum. Now, as the captain pointed out, Shawcross was picked up and he was questioned for this murder. It took some time, but he would eventually confess to killing Karen Hill. He also told investigators where they could find Jack Blake's body. On Tuesday, October 17th, 1972, after much negotiation, Arthur Shawcross pled guilty to the lesser charge of first-degree manslaughter. And after proceedings which lasted only 20 minutes, he was sentenced to a maximum term of 2 to 25 years for the murder of Karen Hill by a disgusted judge who had the misfortune of actually having seen Shawcross in front of him before. This was the same judge who had sentenced him to five years for the arsons in the robbery. This manslaughter sentence was light, um, but it was agreed to in part to clear the Jack Blake case. However, he was never charged with the murder of Jack Blake. Right. I think it came down to the police didn't know what happened. They assumed that it was, Shaw Cross, but that the, the family wanted to know too, and they wanted to know some details. And so I think that's why they made this uh, horrible agreement. Yeah. They needed to recover the, the boy's body. Right. And without Shaw Cross, that wasn't going to happen. And I think leading up to this point, I think the police thought that it was a little far fetched that somebody had killed the boy until they find this girl dead. Now all of a sudden that it doesn't seem so, so big of a leap right that we we may have a child killer killer in our area so now we have his second set of prison years um, which started in 1973 he was once again sent to attica prison during this time period he states that he was threatened by other inmates because of his crimes against children Uh, he filed for divorce from his wife penny because she refused to visit him while he was in prison. Oh, right. Well, sorry, I'm not visiting a piece of shit that kills children. He earned his high school equivalency certificate and qualified in carpentry. He was transferred to Green Haven Correctional Facility at Stormville, New York. This prison houses many of the state's most evil criminals where 742 prisoners, this is 33% of the population at that time, were rapists and murderers. Mm. Prison psychiatrists diagnosed him as a dangerous schizophrenic pedophile suffering from an intermittent explosive personality, and it was noted that he heard voices when he was depressed. Shawcross was a troublesome inmate, and he continually faked illness or psychiatric problems to gain attention. Mm. We've seen this before. Mm -hmm. Fake the runaway, get attention fake you know when he was married i think to his second wife when he'd fake illness so he didn't go to work he soon learned that the key to an early parole lie in the hands of the people around him so what he decided to do was he started playing the game and he started sucking up to the the officers in the prison sucking up to the prison psychiatrist and the church that was offered there And he started to behave himself. He became a model prisoner. He gained a pen pal named Rose Marie Wally. Now, while well into his sentence, Arthur was found exhibiting all the behavioral traits of a reformed man. He figured that it was better to accept responsibility for the murder of Karen Hill. He worked his way into a counselor's job in the prison's mental health unit, 
While there, he learned the language of psychiatry and psychology, and in doing so, he eventually conned the support of three of the three-man state parole panel who granted him his freedom. Hmm. He was granted parole on his ninth attempt. His, he was denied the first eight attempts. On Tuesday, April 28, 1987, the gates of hell were opened and out walked Arthur J. Shawcross, a man who spent just 15 years in prison for, in all reality, what was the rape and murder of two children. Yeah, it should have been two life sentences or like the death penalty. But uh, because they didn't have the body, they had to make that agreement. And there was a parole officer. This is Robert Kent who objected and made a statement of, quote, at the risk of sounding dramatic, this man could be possibly the most dangerous individual to have been released to this community in years. He was, in fact, released on parole. And Arthur Shawcross had difficulty settling down in the communities as the neighbors would protest his presence and employers would fire him. Yeah. He first moved to Binghamton, New York, and then relocated to Delhi, New York. This with his girlfriend, Rose. Remember, she was once his pen pal while he was in prison. When Delhi residents became aware of Shawcross's presence, the couple were forced to move to nearby Fleischman's, New York, only to be met with hostility there as well. Finally, in late June of 1987, Shawcross's parole officer moved him to the a transient hotel in Rochester, New York. In mid-October, Shawcross and his girlfriend Rose found a more permanent lodging. This was at 241 Alexander Street in Rochester. Now, Rochester is a city that is much larger than his previous stays. And it was believed and encouraged by his parole officer that the larger population would allow Shawcross to kind of sink into the community and back into civilian life. Mm. Or be a cover. Well, Rose, once they were there, Rose enrolled as a nurse at the local hospital and Arthur Shawcross found work with a vegetable and fruit wholesaler based in the public market, which was to the south of the city. He would cycle an hour each way on a lady-style Blue Schwinn suburban bike. Hey, okay, maybe it was a different bike before. Well, maybe I don't know. Ladies' bikes. But that's what I think you're hitting on here, Captain. I don't know if the other, because it was two white bikes or maybe the same white bike. Or but maybe, it seems like he's, maybe he painted the old white bike blue. It seems like he's always having a, a woman's. Well, this, again, is another city. So I don't know that he's bringing the bike with him. Hey, you never know. <laughs> after a long prison sentence to the uh, new city of Rochester. But again, a lady style bike for some reason, I don't know. Maybe he prefers the, uh, what is that? The crossbar that's the low no there. crossbar. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, this bike was quite distinct in itself. It was a blue Schwinn suburban bike, which had a shallow basket um, and had a stars and stripes flag on the handlebars with two deep baskets straddling the rear wheel in which he would keep his fishing gear. So he's a creature of habit, of course, Captain. We see this guy that in his free time, he's going to bicycle around town and he's going to go fishing. Mm -hmm. His weekday working hours were between 7 a.m. and 3.30 p.m., which left him the evenings to pursue his hobbies, let's say. Well, do we know what shift his wife is working? I believe she worked the evening shift. Mm Mm-hmm. So he'd be by himself quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And he was actually having an affair at this time as well with a woman named Clara Neal. She was uh, 40. She was 58 years old um, and she had a lot of kids, a lot of grandkids. But the two of them were having an affair while his girlfriend was at work. Mm -hmm. He would borrow cars from both his girlfriend that he lived with and the woman that he was having an affair with. Now, um, one of the vehicles was a small metallic blue Dodge Omni, and the other was a some sort of gray Chevrolet. I used to drive a Dodge Omni. Yeah, and he, well, he would use these to do, you know, run errands, to go out on the evenings, or to go fishing. Mm-hmm. Now, Shawcross married Rose after two years of living together. This okay. took place in August of 1989. Right, and the count of wives for 
Arthur is up to number four. Yeah. Just putting that out there. Well, and it was sometime after his wedding, Captain, that his employer found out and discovered that he was a former convict. And at at that point, they released him or fired him from their employment. His next job that he had was selling hot dogs on Main Street before he landed a permanent job as a salad maker for the G&G Food Services, which provided catering services to hospitals and schools. Now, at that time, Arthur did work the night shift. He worked nights and he was getting paid $6 and 25 cents an hour, Mm -hmm. uh, which this was back in 1987. Mm -hmm. So actually approximately, if you convert that to today's, he would approximately been making about like 13 to $14 an hour, which is pretty good money for somebody that's been forced to move around because they're a convict that nobody wants to hire. Right. Also during this time, shortly before his marriage, he started visiting sex workers and having sex with them. Uh, female, male, uh, females. Well, and starting in 1988, Rochester is going to find, um, a problem on their hands. Cause they're going to find a series of murdered victims, female victims. Well, and the first believed victim in this series that you had mentioned, Captain, is thought to be Dorothy, who went by the name of Dotsie. Dorothy Blackburn, she was 27 years old. She was a mother of a six-month-old boy and two older children. She was a small-boned woman with a slender figure, uh, brown eyes and long brown hair, petite and dainty. She was streetwise with two convictions for loitering in 1985. She was last seen alive on Tuesday. This is March 15th, 1988, after having lunch with her sister. And she was seen on a a place that's going to become familiar throughout this case, and it's called Lyle Avenue. Mm -hmm. During an interview many years later, Shawcross claimed that he had been driving Claire Neal's Omni around. And he admitted that he had killed Dotsie at the Northampton Park because she had bitten his penis during fellatio. He said that she was laughing at him because he couldn't get his, what he refers to as, he couldn't get his pecker up. Mm -hmm. And when she started laughing at him and making fun of him, he said that he slapped her around. And when he did that, she bit him. And he got madder in hell, and that's when he decided to kill her. He had the old wet noodle. He says that he dumped her clothes in a trash can. He cleaned the blood from the seat of the car, and then he drove home. Now, Dotsie's body was found by hunters during the morning of Tuesday, March 24th, floating face down in Salmon Creek, Mm. a stream that meanders through farmland and woods on Rochester's eastern fringe. A crew of laborers clearing debris and garbage that had clogged a culvert. They soon realized, however, that what they were looking at was a woman's frozen body. Her face had a distinctive heavy eyebrows, full lips, slightly irregular teeth, and her left eye was shut. She had long, dark hair and wore jeans, a hooded sweatshirt, and a single white Soda Pops brand sneaker. At the autopsy, the medical examiner determined that she had died as a result of manual strangulation and noted that she had been bitten several times around the vagina. Which is probably retaliation for her biting his penis. So I'm I'm guessing those bites around the vagina. Well, yes, or or as he claims. Mm -hmm. He's a, well, yeah, who knows what to believe with Arthur. A lot more to get to on this case in part two. If you'd like to support the garage, go to truecrimegarage.com. Click on the store page and check out the nice jib tank tops. Thank you to everybody for joining us here in the garage tonight. We will see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Don't litter.